guess what I'm going to say is, is a little bit pessimistic, so I hope that it's going to be balanced out with some you know, in, inspirational stuff from the other, from the other people on the, uh, on the panel. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not an academic, uh, so the, it's, it's quite theory light. But uh, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, Ethical Consumer Magazine and the co-op we have there, uh, just to give it a bit of grounding, and then I'll, I'll broaden it out as I, as I go. Uh, so Ethical Consumer, uh, we produce buyer's guides for, for people so that they can choose the most ethical thing when they go shopping. It's quite lifestyle, lifestyle-y, but it's backed up with some really good research around uh, corporations and what they do and uh, around workers rights and environmental environmental uh, reporting and the actual things around the, the way they abuse the environment so so that's what we do uh, but it's the structure I want to talk about because that's what's that's what's interesting for, for this panel so uh, we're in what's known as an industrial providence society which is a type of type of co-op and this means that we take uh, a type of investment money from people, and we have a class of, uh, sort of shareholders which are known as investor members. Uh, and these guys are primarily our, our readership, uh, but for instance, they also come from our wider stakeholders. So the phone co op, which is another, another British co op, they've got shares, shares uh, in, the, in the co op. So uh, we tend to sort of vet and check the people that we're taking the, the, the money from, uh, so we wouldn't let you know, uh, Tesco, for example, invest invest in the co-op, uh, or any sort of uh, you know typical investment funds. Uh, so, so basically, uh, what we're what we're looking to do is to try and build up build up capital, but in a way that in a way that uh, allows us to keep control. And we do that not only by vetting who's actually investing in the co-op, but also by the makeup of the co-op and, and how the how it, the structure works. So, uh, at the top we've got sort of a, at the top at the top we've got a board of directors, and there's nine in total. Uh, five are worker directors, which are elected from inside the co-op. Uh, two are appointees, so they're appointed by the worker members, not the worker directors, the worker members. And two are investor members who are voted in. Uh, by the investors themselves, so it means there's always uh, a majority of uh, of workers. Uh, the workers are always in a majority, basically, on the board. Uh, then at the next level down, uh, there's sort of uh, ten workers who take part in the sort of monthly monthly management, uh, and we don't we don't really employ anyone from outside the co-op, so we're not. We might be self-exploitative in some ways, but we don't we don't take in any 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 outside any outside labour that's not part of that sort of democratic process, uh, that sort of self self government governance. So uh, it's quite you know it's quite an interesting it's quite an interesting model and gives us quite an interesting relationship with with the with the investment that we have because uh, we we basically we feel like we've got sort of total control over it and it's really allowed us to progress it's quite we've we've only had this structure for sort of a year we were a very traditional sort of workers co-op before that uh, and it's it's really allowed us to to develop what we're doing and we have a, a really great new website and we've got other sort of open data projects in in the pipeline as well which which this sort of this investment from our sort of ethical investors will will help us to do so it's it's quite interesting uh, so a couple of other things that I guess are important for for co-ops uh, is to be sort of based in your local community. And sorry, I'm quite nervous, so I'm, I'm going to drink a lot. So. Uh, so uh, we're based in a in a the office itself is based in a housing co-op, and it's also part of a, a wider sort of office cooperative. Which is uh, which is called Work for Change, which is based in the housing co-op, which is Homes for Change. So it's like co-ops within co-ops, and it's 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 a good model. Uh, we also uh, vet all our suppliers. Uh, you know, we do ethical screenings for other companies for our suppliers, and, but we do it for our own as well, obviously. So all our suppliers and uh, the printers, etc., that we use are all cooperatives as well. So this helps, you know, to keep the 
to keep the, the money in the family, I guess, is, is kind of a good way of saying it. So it's quite a unique structure and, in, in, you know, it's quite, I guess it's quite important to us. Uh, I guess it's quite important to us and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to maintain it. So, uh, so yeah, now I'm going to, now, now that's, that's the positive bit. Now, now, we've got the, now we've got the pessimism. Okay, so in, in Britain as everywhere, we're going through this so-called sort of austerity measures. Uh, and, you know, I won't bore you with, with the details because I'm sure you know all about it, but public services are being cut and there's sort of a 25% cut in each department. Uh, the figures on how many jobs have actually been lost really vary, so I'm not going to, I've got a figure here, but I'm not going to say it because it might be, it might be way out, but it's, it's, it's a lot. And obviously we know it's, uh, it's all about the marketization of public services and it's been ideologically driven. Uh, okay, so basically as part of this uh, process of, of the cuts, the Conservative government has been trying to introduce co-ops into public services to provide certain services and also to run things like the primary healthcare trusts, which are sort of the management committees that organise organise the actual services for users. Uh, but it's so I guess the issues we have is uh, is sort of around what form these these mutuals mutuals take. So in the the article I wrote, uh, I'll just read out my final paragraph because I guess it sums up sort of a little bit of way of, of looking at the looking at these these new co-ops so uh, the final paragraphs w went something like we need a polyculture of dissent not a monoculture of reactionary and oppositional politics the strengths of uh, co-ops come from their ability to meet the needs of workers and encourage autonomous action on a daily basis a revolution in which we lead our everyday lives as long as we reflect and engage critically with them which is kind of important at the moment, uh, developing and adapting them as we do methods of protest. Uh, they can help build a strong, confident movement rooted in local communities with the uh, resources and abilities to challenge the hegemony of capital. Uh, okay, so there's sort of a few key aspects that would seem to be uh, sort of uh, important for a co-op to be, to be, to be radical. Uh, the first is like a, a strong internal democracy, uh, meeting the needs of workers, uh, dealing with, with, with other co-ops, you know, the idea of sort of mutual aid, uh, and also uh, the sort of personal aspects of it, and then rooted in community. Uh, when they're failing to fulfill their radical potential, uh, this is usually to do with another set of criteria, that's uh, Investments, although I hope ethical consumer, we're going to avoid that minefield. Uh, a lack of democracy, self-exploitation, uh, not rooted in the community, and few links with with other co-ops. Okay, so I'll go back to the to the to conservative government now. There is a method to this. It's a bit it's jumping around a little bit, but we're okay. Uh, so at the moment, the mutuals uh, are being set up. They're defined as these uh, pathfinders. And so the way in which the, the government's going about it is, is important to look at because what they're doing is these, these pathfinders, these new co-ops that they're putting together, uh, they've, been, they've been helped by a number of existing, uh, existing mutuals, basically. And it's interesting to look at which, which ones they are because it, it shows quite clearly the direction that they're, that they're going in. So uh, one of them, for instance, is the... John Lewis Partnership, which is basically, it has a very sort of limited, uh, a very limited internal democracy, and it's a, it's a basically a big chain of department stores, and it's it's not particularly interesting or, or radical, and but possibly one of the worst ones that they've got in this sort of group is uh, KPMG. I don't know if if you know KPMG, they're a, they're an auditing and accounting company, and they basically they one of their major roles at the moment is sort of helping uh, major major corporations avoid tax in various various countries. Uh, they've done it with Shell; is quite a, quite a big one. So that's that's interesting that, that these are the companies that they're using to to put forward these these mutuals. Okay. 
well, five minutes, okay. Uh, so there's a few more in the pipeline. Uh, so it's first sort of baby steps, it's like the Ed Mayo of the, the co-op group sort of said. Uh, so there's a number of uh, there's a number of sort of general barriers to to uh, to this being successful, uh, this, the establishment of these co-ops, including the sort of a lack of knowledge of co-ops within state sector workers, uh, a lack of knowledge of state industry inside co-ops that are outside. So that sort of interconnection uh, is difficult. Uh, there's a lack of sort of government support f for co-ops, and that's particularly, uh, at, you know, pressing at the moment because even though they've got this, the way that they're doing it, they're not changing any legal structures or anything, so they're going to be totally open up to the markets. Uh, in, in the past, the co-op movements always complemented the state sector, and now this seems to be undermining it a little bit. Uh, sorry, I'm using this as kind of an auto cue, and I've just gone on too far. Uh, okay, so there's no there's no big networks uh, in England in the same way that there is in uh, in in you know with Mondragon in in, in the Basque region. Uh, we have Co-ops UK, but it's not it doesn't work in the same way, and these formal links don't don't really exist in the same way. Uh, there's not been any extra money really being channeled into setting up these new cooperatives. So uh, if, if there were no cuts and they were trying to do this democratization of the workplaces, it might be more interesting, but now it's not really being given the, the resources that it needs. Uh, and one of the worrying things is, is the competition that they're opening them up to. So you've got new businesses, but with no, no protection from the state. So they're going to be... Uh, yeah, you know they, they have to cope with the rigors of the market almost immediately, which is which is quite dangerous. And the, the next thing, uh, another thing is sort of outside influence. So uh, one one uh, employee-owned uh, company uh, is actually sort of owned by 51% by a, a very typical investment equity uh, company. So that is a problem as well. Uh, so, so just going through the through sort of the key aspects of what what a cooperative makes a sort of cooperative quite radical. Uh, internal democracy. Well, most of them don't really have any sort of internal democracy. So I, basically, I wrote to the cabinet office asking them a whole bunch of questions about these new Pathfinder. Cabinet office is a government department in Britain, and I wrote to. Uh, to them and asked them a whole bunch of questions because it's quite new and they only got back to me on some of them. So when, you know, when you're asking people questions, you go in quite lightly and, oh yeah, Pathfinders, it's great, it's brilliant, but then, so they send you loads of information and then you start asking more difficult questions, they send you less and less information and, and make it more and more difficult. So uh, it's quite new and I've not been able to do loads of research, so I'm, there's, there's, a few, there's a few little gaps, so I'm sorry about that. But, uh, uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lack of, of internal democracy in them. There's not n none of them, as far as I can tell, are workers' co-ops. For instance, they're totally uh, seem to be based around this sort of John Lewis model. Uh, it's going to be very difficult because there's not many of them setting up to to be able to do this mutual aid thing where they're all working together. Uh, in fact, because of the privatisation thing, they're going to be working less and less with the state sector as well, and more and more with the big. Uh, U.S. companies that are moving into the to the sector. Uh, okay, so a lot of a lot of times it's about the personal things, uh, the personal relationships within the co-ops that make them radical. But there's no real history of that in these. I mean, there's no history at all because they're new, uh, and the people in them probably haven't been involved in, in in other sort of radical politics or progressive politics, and and that's one problem, with the exception of maybe the maybe the unions. Uh, as I said, investment's a problem. Circle Healthcare, uh, for instance, is 51% owned by city investors and pays them a dividend, but it's classed as a mutual, which is which is crazy. So they're sort of massaging the stats. Some of them aren't really mutuals, even though they're classing them as mutuals. Uh, so more more broadly, 
Uh, obviously, they're no longer sort of democratically accountable to, to the electorate. Uh, if you know, if they were, uh, all with our limited democracy, so it's undermining the democratic control uh, and opening up to the market. Uh, one minute, okay. Uh, and there's, I think, part of the part of the big problem is for for the co-op brand, as it were, is that it does pose a big sort of reputation risk to the idea of cooperatives. Firstly, that they're seen as, as undermining the state and being part of this marketisation. And secondly, that because they don't have any protection or, or improved legal structure, they could well uh, all fail within the first six months. And it, it, it looks bad for cooperatives, even though, you know, it's, it's not been properly set up. Oh, say, okay, so to conclude, uh, it's a quote from a poem by Matthew Arnold in, in uh, 1847, which was a time of another crisis, and it says, uh, we're wandering between two worlds, one dead and the other powerless to be born. And it feels that that's quite sort of a, a you know, a prescient statement because, uh, you know, we're, the, it feels like the co-op movement is now in a, in a, in a really strong position uh, to provide like a, a, a very practical alternative model, but it feels without any 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 state intervention or anything, it's very difficult for that to happen at the moment. Uh, especially at the moment, we're moving from sort of centralised systems, and this is, I guess, this is part of the root of the crisis, from sort of centralised systems and mass production of the 20th century to small units and large systems brought about by new uh, communications technologies, uh, and the democratization of products like Linux and Wikipedia that has like built-in democracy. <laughs> One minute, okay. Uh, oh, I'm over, I'm over. Okay, well, let, I'll, let, 30 seconds. Uh, so, you know, this, this technology has uh, brought about a new sense of collectivity and it's transforming capitalism sort of on a daily basis. Uh, so there is a great change in, in the co-op ethos seems to fit with this changing uh, model of, of, of capitalism and seems a good way to, to, it is to, you know, it's reformist to move, to move capitalism on but in a, in a positive way because now, you know, everything's up for grabs and it could go one way or the other way but it seems like the, the co-op model fits with this new type of uh, democratic, uh, democratic system and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. There is more, but I'll leave it and pass it. Pass well, it thank on. you very much, Tim, for um, <laughs> participating in this. <laughs>